Okay, and now we should be live recording. So once again, welcome everyone. Think Think RG Wishy meeting. Uh, here is our draft agenda for today. I will very briefly touch upon the some of the wishy activities uh, we have ongoing and, and, and planned now in, in the future. But the um, bulk of this meeting would be idea would be to focus on the Azure DDDL and, and SDF in their work follow up. Um, so we did this start the DDDL uh, discussion quite some time time ago. Has been some progress on that. So we I'm thinking now would be a good time to get back to that topic and see where we are and what will be a, a good way forward. Um, so I, I, I see we have uh, Brian Cropper from the uh, Azure DTDL team at, at least joining. So well, well, welcome, Brian. Hi, thanks. Um, then, so that's roughly, um, we reserved a full hour for that just to make sure we have in, enough enough time for it. Um, but we can, of course, also um, spend less time if, if, if we if, if we seem necessary, but then following that would be either to spend something around 20 minutes on this IoT information model standards description or IoT landscape document, as we called it earlier. So Milan will be taking a lead there. <clears throat> and finally, let, let's see if we had time and if we have a, um, actually Sebastian managed to join. He said he won't be av available at least for the first hour. We could briefly touch the topic of W3C Web of Things thing models. Which are of course also very much related to the to the other work that we'll we'll be discussing today. That's the agenda for today. Any questions or comments here? Okay, then mo moving forward. Um, quick update on the wishy activities. So right right now we are on on, on one of these wishy meetings, and um, it's been a while since since last time but we're planning to return to our roughly useful cadence around around september um but then there's also a a ietf uh online meeting happening uh in july and before the ietf week there's usually a, a hackathon week and and some of us have been taking part in the hackathon activities and there was a uh, one idea um you know carson proposed that we could also have a a wishy hackathon activity there so, Karsten, would you like to say a few words about that? Yes, so <clears throat> we have traditionally been able to make good use of the week before the uh, IETF uh, to, to uh, make forward uh, progress uh, on um, SDF, on converters, uh, and so on. So we want to continue that uh, tradition this week. and. Uh, um, yeah, we, we still have to, to find out uh, who exactly will be there with uh, which converter. So the, the slide lists uh, Jana's SDF uh, to Yang converter, which, by the way, now has a, a website that you can uh, play with. So if you have an SDF model, you can convert it to Yang. And if you have a Yang model, you conver can convert it to uh, SDF. And, and feedback is, is very uh, welcome on that. And uh, we will um, see who can bring other converters. Uh, so we we actually get to a situation where where we can uh, feed models back and forward and get something useful for the various ecosystems um, that, that are uh, participating. Um, so so we can also learn what else SDF needs to do to make this make the conversion results uh, uh, as good as possible. Okay, very good. Thanks, Karsten. Any questions or comments on the planned activities here? Okay, good. Um, Unfortunately, it looks unlikely I will be able to make that hackathon. I will plan it to be on summer vacation, but let's see, maybe it's a rainy day in Finland and I'll <laughs> manage, manage to call in. But I think it's a very good activities that we have had in the past, as Karsten said. So if you have a chance, I highly recommend joining. So um, I have prepared a few slides about the DDDL uh, SDF discussion, but maybe before we go there, um, 
Brian, and in, in any updates on the on the DDVL since last time we discussed from from you or from your team that you would like to like to share here? I think there's probably a couple things I can share. Um, uh, one is we've now got full support for DTDLv2 with our current version in um, in our Azure Digital Twin service. And so that's been available for customers. And then we've, we're getting support that's coming online in another one of our services, IoT Central. Um, one interesting thing uh, on the open source side is that we've actually got now a set of open source DTDL based ontologies in GitHub for some different domains. We've got one for smart buildings um, based on the real estate core um, ontology that's uh, that their OWL ontology. We've got that in DTDL available. Um, and then we've got one for uh, smart cities, and that's based on, now I can't remember off the top of my head, but that's based on a standards organization we were working with in the smart cities domain. And then we've got one on energy grids as well. And so those are all on GitHub and um, DTL based ontologies that um, are, are open source and available for use. I think that's, I think that's kind of our current update for where we're at with DTDL. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Brian. One um, question, because that has been coming up repeatedly. Uh, those models that you have been talking about, you said they are open source. Can do, can you possibly be more specific on the open source license? Uh, the license is on the GitHub. Uh, I would have to go look at see exactly which license it is. Um, OK. But, uh, but in terms of, yeah, so there's there's a license that's out there, and I can publish these, um, I can put the links into the chat here in a little bit. Uh, right. But but then they also do accept sub submissions as well. So, you know, for people working in those domains, if, you know, there's an area not covered or something that needs to be fixed, um, those projects are also accepting submissions. Hi, this is uh, Bruce Nordman. Um, I'm interested in what you said about energy grids. Uh, I'm interested in, um, well, I think we can depose our energy systems into wide area networks and then local area power distribution within customer sites and then the interface between them. Does what you're doing cover uh, all of that or portions of that? Uh, so, so I'm not personally an expert in in the energy grid space. Um, I uh, some other people on our team actually worked on the details there. From what I and I don't even know really sort of the separation um, of the different areas in that domain. But um, it looks like it's based. It it looked like it was based on um, from what I remember, like power station, substations, lines, those kinds of um, concepts in in the energy grid space. But I'll put, I'll put the links into the chat, and then um, I think if you go out there and look, you can probably pretty quickly see what area it is if you've if you've got expertise in that domain. Yeah, actually, mine is within customer sites, you know, within buildings, and also the interface between buildings and the grid. I'm not I'm not a grid person. Okay, uh, but... I believe this is more energy grid than um, than the the parts you know connecting to buildings, but. Uh, uh, I'm not an expert there either, so I, I don't actually know all of the details of what what would be needed. Yeah, actually, maybe I'll I'll put my uh, email in the chat, and if you can forward it to the people more energy focused, that would be great. Um, and maybe we could add sort of the notion of the the local area power distribution to your to your overall thinking. Yeah, no, totally. So we um, we're very, we're, you know, we're looking to do more of these things. I see that um, Michael's already actually posted the links into the chat for the different um, ontologies there, which is great. Thanks. Um, and uh, no, we we want to do more of these and, and and improve these. So certainly, if you or you know anyone has more more to add or um, you know other domains that you want to see happening, we've got a. A, a group of people that are actually working with partners and uh, other standards on doing these ontologies. Yeah, and some context here is that um, traditionally the electricity grid has been organized sort of in, in a way similar to how the old phone system was organized, very centralized and unitary. And it's now 
I think moving more towards a network model, both within buildings and with the grid. And I'm particularly mm -hmm. trying to do that within buildings. Uh, and then maybe this effort could help, could help move that. Yeah, no, that, that sounds great. Okay. I put my contact info in the chat. So thanks. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Thank, thank you. And actually it would be <clears throat> interesting to see more um, these um, ontologies in use with the uh, DTDL models. Do you have some examples uh, online where, where DRTs are being used? Uh, I believe that there is one that's done by the Willow company that um, has taken the, the smart buildings one. I think they've got this in a public repository in GitHub as well where they've taken the smart building or the, uh, the the smart buildings, the buildings ontology that was based on another state core, and they've done, you know, added their own customizations on top of that. And so at least from an ontology perspective, you can see how they've used it. I don't think that they've done, that they've published anything around um, their actual solution that then makes use of that ontology, but you can see how they've gone in and, and um, you know, been able to layer some customizations on top of it. And I can find that thing as well. Okay, in interesting. Because I was kind of specifically thinking like like which of the DDL features are, are is it is it using is it using the the relationship features or is it using the some of the or the type features? Because that was something. Well, it's it's going to come in in my presentation soon when we discuss about some of the additions we are planning for STF to support that kind of things. Yeah, the, what they use, what those ontologies are built for is um, primarily for the use case of use, being used with Azure Digital Twins. So what you'll see in those ontologies is they heavily you make use of um, of properties for all the state information about the different um, assets and things, equipment and that kind of stuff, and then um, and and relationships for building out you know um, the 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 different larger concepts. So you know you'll see relationships between um, you know sensors and actuators and equipment in there. And then you'll see relationships between um, different concepts as well. And so you'll see that heavily used. And uh, and then there's some amount of inheritance as well, where they do specialization for, you know, say different types of rooms and things like that. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah if you can. Find 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 those examples. I think that would be a, a good thing for us to us to have a look at. Yep, um, I will do that. Okay, thanks. Um, and, and any other updates or any questions or comments on the DDL updates before we move to the STF discussion? Okay, good. Um. So I, I can report a bit back on the progress we have done uh, with the with the DDL STF in the work since our our last meeting, and then we could discuss in the end. I mean, kind of way forward uh, how we want uh, these two ecosystems and, and standards work working together. So first, um, some of our our latest experience. So I I've been working with a couple of colleagues. Uh, in part, Petri Lari, my colleague, has been active here on the implementations for conversions between STF and DDDL. And as of today, we do have um, two implementations, one, one for each direction. I think for the STF to DDDL, we seem to be able to do quite complete conversion of, of, of STF features that we can express in, in DDDL. Of course, a big question is, are we doing it right? <laughs> but um, for that purpose, I, I, I shared some of the examples um, with, with you earlier that have been done with our, our, our conversion. And I could also, uh, put uh, them so wishy repository with a couple of examples. I'll put that on the on the meeting notes, so you can all find it there. Um, and then on the other direction, uh, from DDL to STF, we have a it's got a quite a bit more early implementation. Uh, seeing like can we how much how much information are, are we losing when we go back and forth, and how can we uh, import different DDL models into STF? And, and that's why it would be interesting to see kind of a, a set of DDDL models that are, have been done by, by someone specifically for DDDL that we could see like how well can we perhaps express those uh, in STF. 
but that's still an, an annual early implementation. We have we've been playing around mostly with, with the models we already converted from SDF to DDDL and then back to uh, SDF. And there's also a link in the slides to the repo showing some of the examples. But we do also have, as of um, 20 minutes ago, a, a demo web service running uh, on, on a public internet host that you can essentially post your um, STF model and it turns it into a, a, a DDDL model. And there's an example curl command that you can use. Um, but bear in mind that's a experimental uh, code and, and web service. So things may, something funny may happen, but, um, but at least as of today, it seemed to be producing some reasonable content. But then on our, on our experiment, of course, there's, as always, when you go from one domain to another, there's some information loss in the translation. And then I, I have a few uh, discussion slides around that. But before we go into details, any, any questions on, on this? That makes sense that um, using DTL to SDF, being that DTL is an RDF, that we really focused SDF on how to uh, express device affordances. But SDF also has a very generic object property model. So uh, I'd be really interested in following up on what kind of uh, extensions might be needed to SDF to to increase the uh, information that we can express in SDF from something like DTDL. In, in, indeed, in, indeed, and that's actually the contents of my next slides. So maybe we go, go there and one. But before you, before you go on, actually, I just wanted to comment on this that I had actually taken a look at the conversion, at least the one way, the SDF to DTDL. I didn't I didn't know there was the the other conversion the other way. And from what I had looked at, it looked like those were you know fairly complete conversions. Um, and you know fairly correct conversions from at least my perspective, from what I understood. Excellent. That 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 sounds very good. And I guess that. Yeah, when, when we look at the two models, I mean, we see we are, we're actually well aligned already on kind of meta level, how do we express things? So it, it was a relatively uh, straightforward thing to do. It was more more on the structure, whereas uh, SDF uses a lot of uh, nesting in the JSON, mm -hmm. uh, then in the uh, DTDL you use references. So that was kind of the <laughs> main part of the implementation, yeah. going back and forth. Yep, good. But I think what's gonna be also interesting when we translate models back and forth, like seeing, how, do, are there going to be some twists in the semantics um, that we use? But I guess that's what we'll be learning, learning when we do more of these models and, and, and see what comes out. Yep. No, that sounds uh, great. Excellent. So one one specific thing that we <clears throat> hit, uh, I mean, this is a classic thing because uh, units, uh, the engineering units is, is something where we actually do have well-specified semantics. Uh, so that, that used to be and, and a lot of these models you use engineering units. So that's also a, a common area where we have good alignment, but also hit some interesting issues. So on, on the unit side, what, what we did learn that both SDF and DDL, they share most units. We're using ISO SI units. Um, and we not all units that are used by uh, DDL are part of uh, the SDF's units because SDF uses the cinema registry. But all those SI units we can simply add to the INA registry uh, of SendML, and then I think we have a very good, uh, easy, easy, simple conversion uh, between those. But then what, what we did realize that some of the DDL units are not SI units. Um, I guess the most interesting example was this slug uh, unit. Um, and while there is a, a programmatic way to convert from, from, from slug to, uh, I think it was to kilograms. Um, it, it's, it's not an SI unit. Probably it would not be suitable for the centimeter registry. So then this raises a question like, how do we express in SDF uh, units that are not suitable for the centimeter registry, but are still used by some of the ecosystems that we, that we are interested in, like, like DDDL? As this SDF really tries to be descriptive and trying to describe the capabilities of each ecosystem, this seems to be a very important capability for us, for us to have. So we had already at the IETF side in the ASDF working group, a discussion on this, and we came up with a proposal that, okay, we could use, instead of just a, a short identifier like, like Slack, we can actually 
also use full URIs uh, in the, as the units, then at least we will have a, a unique identifier pointing to a specific uh, a, a unit within that ecosystem. Gives us, uh, gives us gives us some interoperability on that specific ecosystem and still avoiding to have a yet another registry. Um, so this is, seems to be um, not the most compact thing, but then again, STF models, you don't usually exchange on the wire that often, so it's not, not, not an issue. And of course, it, this would make it kind of ecosystem specific thing, um, but at least we would be able to express any units that um, DTDL has beyond the SI units. Probably doesn't have to be ecosystem specific. You could probably find some other, um, like QUDT might have slugs or whatever. <laughs> um, um, but we we could probably try to find some more public example. But I agree that this would this would work because they do have a URI that it can point to. In 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 indeed indeed. And that, that was kind of the. I guess that's your last problem. bullet. Is there a more generic URI? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> in, in, indeed, but, no, but that, that, that's a very good point because I mean, well, we, we, we could even, uh, you know, we could even like prefer a particular, you know, like QUDT or something like that. We could have a preference for a broader external uh, unit mm -hmm. uh, registry that we use also. That, that's a good point. Like we could have actually query uh, syntax for. Preparing those without having to put full URIs there. Well, it'd just be better interoperability too, because it would be conceptually aligned. Yep. Indeed. So then the yeah. Then I guess the, the radicals also would make sense that if if there's a, a generic thing where these are defined, then maybe using that namespace would make sense. If it turns out there is a, a unit that we, <laughs> well, I know maybe that's a question to you at, at for the on the DTDL side. Um, do you, I guess you get these units from from somewhere, um, and there's probably a, a reference to an external source for these units. And do, do you think there would be like some QDT, the Yukum, or or something that we could use as the namespace? Yeah, so from the DTDL side, there's I, I have a couple of thoughts here on what you're what you're proposing. I think I think uh, so. I guess kind of going back to you know why do we have non-SI units? Um, what we've been finding is that uh, you know in some domains, you know not everyone, not not every domain and not every application is using SI units, and so we've had requests for um, non-SI units, um, US units, other types of things like that, and so we've been. We, you know, have been trying to be accommodating there, recognizing that, uh, you know, different different applications, different domains have these different units, and so, so that's that's why we have those. Um, the the uh, in terms of the the referencing DTL units, I actually think that's a very interesting idea, um, and we actually do have a full URI for each of our units, and I was just trying to go find. Um, what that is, but I'll I'll go find exactly what that uh, that full URI is. And so I could imagine you doing some kind of namespace, um, you know, URI based on that, and then it would match exactly that, you know, the the full URI for each of those units in DTDL, which would which would make it be, um, you know, unique in terms of a URI. So hopefully, if you do that. That when I go and fetch a thing there, if I can do that, I should find um, a typed link that points to one of these public ontologies also that you could align with, and that would be pretty helpful. Yeah. So, um, so all of our URIs are actually we call them DTMIs, um, digital twin model modeling identifiers. So they are they are URIs, but they aren't um, URLs. And so you can't actually dereference them to you know any you know any actual resource. And uh, but they but they still are um, you know used as identifiers for those elements, and then uh, what those do point to is they point to definitions in the DTDL meta model, um, which right now is not publicly available. Um, but that is something that we're looking at making available. So, you know, at that point, you would then actually be able to see those definitions. Uh, just right now, that's not available.
Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, any time frame when you're planning to make it uh, publicly available that we could have a look at? Yeah, I don't know the time frame for that. It is something that we're looking at. Um, you know, we're looking at a couple things with making DTDO more open. One is just first the, the um, you know, we have a GitHub for DTDL, and, um, but we haven't really been taking um, submissions there yet. And so we're working on that, what that looks like for us. And then uh, beyond that, there's also, you know, the, the, the desire um, to make the meta model itself available as well. And so there's sort of those two different things and we're working on both those, but I don't have a specific time frame yet. Okay. Well, one of the items that we probably have to do somewhere, I don't know where yet, um, those DTDL units that actually are uh, congruent with uh, Cinema units, uh, we probably want to make that, that congruence available uh, somewhere. I think that makes sense. Um, and what we haven't done in our meta model, um, which obviously you can't see yet because it's not public, but um, even you know, our internally, we haven't done those references back to any source. Um, you know, and so I actually think that makes sense for us to consider on our side for the for the units that we have, where there is a, you know, where there are other definitions that we know of, is is establishing those links. Okay, so we, we may need to do this for other ecosystems as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the end, this will be a bi-directional effort and we just have to make sure that we don't contradict each other. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, the aligning um, engineering units and scales and things like that is turning out to be one of the bigger problems that we should probably try to you know, get get um, solved in the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Actually, we've been um, hearing from various customers on our side about units and various things they want to do with units. Um, you know, from right now in DTDL, you can only specify them in the model, so they are fixed. Some customers want to be able to adjust those at runtime based on the um the actual devices or equipment that's installed um because it, it as they do discovery um through through those deployed devices some some devices are configured differently than what the than what might be said at the model level so we've got that and then we've got the um we have also heard the desire to um, be able to use existing unit ontologies like qudt or um, ontology of measure those kinds of things Okay, seems to be that we are actually hitting very similar challenges in the in the unit area. Mm -hmm. um, that's indeed the hell. And, and it was also in in the Ipsos Live with them space. We have been discussing this quite a bit in the in the in the past, and we've done a done a set of alignment that like in the in the Ipsos world we also aligned with the Cinemal units. And so that's I mean that that was one 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 way where we actually get quite quite far already. But actually the and also the point of having this unit conversions, I I, I fully agree. And the good thing is that a, a colleague of mine did that for the at least a quite big part of the CNML units and um, and DTDL units. So here you see a fragment of the configuration file um, that he did. That is, is part part of the program that does the conversions. And here you actually see that each of uh, CNML units has two uh, this unit and type uh, because in DTDL you have these what you call semantic types um, that gives um Bit, bit more bit more semantic information for for those units um here we did assume one to one mapping between the uh units and and the semantic type which may or may not be <laughs> accurate um but that has at least seemed to seem to provide so far reasonable results so maybe i mean looking at looking at something like this together uh, I think would be a quite fruitful exercise. Um, Just remember that um, that um, uh, what is it? SC, it was it SC forty one that they're actually working on uh, units also in ISO, and there's there, there's a proposal that has uh, seven fundamental units from which a bunch of other 
uh, types are derived. And I don't know if that's really the way we want to go, but there's there's some idea of instead of having just a huge vocabulary of constructed units, go go to the thing that can be constructed using the basic units. Yeah, that's the usual SI seven dimensional space. That's, that has that's the, it, right? It's well known, the, right? The, Yes, but it has the disadvantage that some things that actually do have a physical meaning reduce to one. And uh, sometimes you just need more information uh, to, to see what, what this one actually means. So do you have liters per liters or kilograms per kilograms? Um, and so on. So that, that's uh, uh, why that, that seven dimensional space is not always sufficient. But it's a good basis. Right. Thanks. Okay, good. So maybe only what we what we could do now short term. I mean I could push this configuration file that you see a fragment here uh in in the in the wishy GitHub. Uh and then maybe on the you guys the, the details I could have a look like like if, if this makes it makes sense, and then it could be a way to provide at least mapping between uh, from from CNML units to to DDL units to some extent. Yeah, I think that would be great. I've been recently looking. I haven't looked at CNML, so I took a, took a note to go do that. Um, I've been looking at QUDT and ontology of measures um, units there, and uh, trying to kind of reason through or think through how those could connect to uh, DTDL, either just directly enabling reuse, um, which which we've heard from some customers that that could be useful. So we're, I've been looking into that a little bit, um, but, uh, but I think it would be great to look at all of these and just kind of figure out like, what's the, you know, wh where does conversion make sense? Where does reuse make sense? And, and start to go down those, explore those paths. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so I, I think there we have a good action item that we could take uh, one of the follow-ups. Good, but then maybe we, in the interest of time, we can now move, move forward and discuss briefly the some of the other piece of missing information and the, and the way, way forward. So one thing that we noticed uh, when we do it from the DDL to SDF conversion is that in, in DDL, as we discussed, you have these uh, relationships. We don't currently have uh, that same concept in SDF, but we already were, had discussed in the standardization at the IETF that we could be adding, adding that. And here's a, a draft example that, that we discussed that should be able to express the same information that that DDL uh, is expressing. So essentially, the <clears throat> what you see here contained in that would be the name element in the relations. Uh, target would be target, and properties would be properties. Um, we're also considering if we want to be able to express using external ontologies more information about the type of of, of this relationship. But that's. We haven't yet implemented this, um, but this is something what, what we're considering now as an addition to SDF to, to support also the kind of uh, relations that DDL has. Any initial reactions on this one? Um, that we have type link vocabulary that looks a little different from this. We have RHEL and href, and I think I brought this up before and you had some good reason we weren't using RHEL and href, but... <laughs> um, I don't remember. And then also SDF, our, our style is more to use singular and not to pluralize things because it, it sort of creates an ambiguity that a lot of systems use singular versus plural to differentiate things. And we decided not to do that and decided that our preferred style was singular. So it'd be SDF relation, but um, I'm not, I'm totally stuck on that. <laughs> Good point. Fixed now in the slide. Cool, thanks. Good. Well, one thing I'm curious about here is you've been looking at um, DTDL relationships and what you might want to represent in SDF is if there's, um, if you've seen any shortcomings there or, you know, from what you would expect to be able to do 
if there are some things, anything we should be considering on the DTDL side as well. And uh, that, that, that's a good question. I guess what, what we'll know more when we look at the other ecosystems that use uh, relations, like one of those ecosystems that has it, uh, the OPC, but I guess the DTDL model was already quite well aligned with OPC uh, models, if I remember correctly. Yeah, to encourage, encourage everyone to um, to open up these meta models and publish them because there's not really a lot of value in keeping them secret, I don't think. But I think everybody knows that. I don't have any contacts in OPC, but it'd be great if they would move that way also. Sounds good. I mean, you can find out about them, but you know, we should be able to just download the document, right? I mean, mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's what would make it easier for us to get more experience on like going ex going between these model ecosystems and um, expressing the information um, using the SDF in the tool as an in between to e e make that easier. But but definitely, I mean, uh, yeah, so far we haven't done any uh, beyond like planning uh, on, on this, but I guess when we'll start actually using this, then we'll know, learn more also whether the DDDL uh, current capabilities fit well. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that, you know, you are also you know, interested in developing DDDL to make that make it easier. So I think that sounds also a very good follow up for us. Yeah, no, I just asked because we had made some decisions like our relationships are one way, for example, um, you know, at, as they're expressed in the model. and um, you know, there's, you know, we've heard questions about that and, and have, and have still stuck with the, the 1 way mo at the modeling level um, doesn't prevent you from doing things like when you actually instantiate these things inside of, you know. A graph database or something from being able to query both directions, but the modeling side, for example, was was 1 way. Um, we've also heard some feedback about the target right now in DTDL. The target can either be any. If you don't provide a target at all, it means relationship points to anything, or you can provide a single target, but we don't have a way to provide, say, a set of targets. We've heard some of that discussion as well. Mm. Okay. And, and is it yeah. that the. That's actually something there is another activity in the ITF going on to uh, actually write up a standard for JSON path. Uh, which might be a good way to to have a target that actually doesn't contain the whole world, but uh, is actually more than one uh, instance. And uh, so th that's that may be something that we can feed into the JSON path uh, working group of the ITF. Th th thanks. Um, one thing I was wondering, like when, when there's this like a uh, single target or, or many targets, is, is it more like uh, you could have a single relation to multiple types or is it that actually multiple relations to multiple types? Or is both? Thanks. <laughs> so you could have an array of targets, but if you have multiple relations, that's just separate links and it's, a, it's only really a an optimization to have a text form that has them all together. Yeah, exactly. When we have a relationship in DTDL, um, say it's called con contained in, like your example here, it, it on the instance side, like in a in a graph database, for example, you could have many instances of that named um, relationship, so many edges in your graph. Um, but if there's a target specified depending on you know the implementation or whatever um you know that indicates that what's expected there at the end of that edge the other side of that edge is something of that type so you may have many of them but they all would be in this example they'd all be of this room type yep okay good so yeah, I guess I hear the good way forward. I mean, we'll, we'll be experimenting more on what makes sense on, on, on the STF side and then 
when we get more experience, we could get back and, and also see like if there are some things that we would like to express more on the DDDL side. Um, we could see like how how to best go forward with those. Good, and then for to, to the other direction, going from SDF to to DDDL, a um, couple of things we we noticed that are we we lose in translation. One one particular was this in SDF we have this info block we have uh, information such as copyright license title of the model uh, etc. Um, so some of those, I mean like we could put for example in the description element um, and your title can go to name element, but then like um, copyright and license they don't have specific uh, ways to express in DDL. So I mean, the question would be if that's something you have considered or maybe you have already on the on the roadmap for DDL? Yeah, yeah, from the DTL side, it's something we've heard about a little bit. One of the other things that we've actually been hearing is that um, is that it may be more useful to to provide some kind of structure around a collection of models, you know, into an ontology. And so we've been, and this is, you know, just this is early thinking on this. We haven't really put this on a roadmap yet, but we've been looking at the idea of are there, you know, should we have some way of expressing ontologies and then some of this other information? But I think it's fair, like maybe we need to look at both. Um, can you provide this the copyright license, et cetera, in the, you know, at, at each model level? And then if we were ever to do some kind of um, ontology or collection of models, maybe it's there as well. Okay, good, because, um, and then also, what Karsten pointed out, I mean, there is um, an IDF work on uh, some harmonizing ways to express some of this uh, information. So there's a, a draft. Uh, Karsten, maybe you want to say a quick few words about that? Yeah, so one <clears throat> kind of uh, model that we try to uh, use on the security side is to de model the uh, communications requirements of a device. Um, Carson, are, are you breaking up? I think we lost his audio. We lost Carson's audio, yeah. Well, I should be back. Now you're back. Yeah, there, there's uh, some... Something is going wrong with my VDSL due to the outside temperature. Um, so um, the the manufacturer's user description uh, gives you information about the communication requirements uh, of a device. And uh, when you actually compose uh, systems, then you compose devices and you have to compose the manufacturer user descriptions. And uh, of course, this immediately raises uh, copyright issues. Um, so we just have to get this this little detail uh, out of the way because uh, you, you are composing devices from different manufacturers. Uh, so you have to make sure that, that uh, you are even allowed to to put these things together. Of course, you can also completely ignore that that uh, aspect, which we probably all have been doing in the past. But but given that these bodies of work are getting bigger and bigger, we probably should be starting to think uh, about licensing issues here as well. Okay, Th thanks Carson. So maybe, maybe that's something we would also think about like having those kind of elements and then maybe even uh, aligning on some time frame, on like what what we expressed, so we could have to do less translation, but we could actually use the information as is. Okay. Um. Maybe if, if we continue, then the other one in in um in STF files, uh, for example, for the, for the properties and other data elements, we can define something. More details about what the data shapes, like you know whether its value has minimum, maximum, or if a string has a minimum or maximum length, or follows certain pattern, 
which are default and constant values, uh, we didn't immediately find anything like this in the DDDL. Um, so maybe the question is like, did we look in the wrong place or is this something you have considered? Yeah, again, yeah, from the DTDL side, yeah, it, that's not there. So yeah, you wouldn't find that. Our, our idea for that, which we haven't yet, um, uh, I guess, made fully available is to is to enable that through our semantic types. So um, you'd be able to enable you to be able to attach, say, on a property in DTDL, a semantic type of, say, you know, operating constraints or something like that that would um, provide let you then provide a min and max value for for numbers or you know lengths and patterns for strings those kinds of things and one of our thoughts around that was rather than rather than providing a single min max that there there may be different constraints that you want to apply to the same property like there there may be sort of manufacturing constraints or limits and then there may be operational ones and those may and you may want to apply so you may have multiple mins or multiple maxes in uh, for a particular um, value and so that that's been our thinking but we haven't actually fully realized that yet i i don't know if if there's been um you know from your side if you've seen scenarios like that or or if you know single min max really meets the need and, and we should just do that from the dtdl side So not really, I, I guess it depends. Um, so I could see devices having, like you said, manufacturing constraints, but I have not seen anything yet that wouldn't be served by a single min max on a single property uh, of, of a scalar value. There are different scale conversions that we need to do that have different min and maxes on the different scales, but I think that is handling something that's something different. Yeah, th th this may be a case on our side of us sort of overthinking this, and we should just go with the simple min max for numbers and you know the the various other limits for strings, those kinds of things. So an example would be a temperature sensor where you know that the temperature cannot be below zero Kelvin. So th this is kind of a fundamental property of temperatures. Uh, so they have a min of zero. Um, but then a specific temperature sensor also has a minimum and a maximum value that it, it can be used at. Uh, so I, I can imagine that uh, you actually want to combine uh, these these uh, various kinds of limitation on a specific item. So there would be a need to do uh, an override, but actually you if you had an API, you would really only see the most recent override value. You wouldn't see the, the other one, or would you... Would you want to include both of those, like a fundamental minimum and an instance minimum or something like that? Like, is there yeah, a need to do it's, that? It's maybe not even an override. It's more of a combined uh, thing. So if, if a temperature sensor doesn't have a minimum uh, from the manufacturing point of view, it still cannot show temperatures that are below zero Kelvin. So you, you, would, you would never override that aspect you would further constrain it hmm. but still seems like a given instance of a temperature sensor in normal use you don't really need to worry about the fact that it can't ever go below zero as a temperature um, but mostly the usefulness is in knowing what the limit of the scale for for the particular sensor is so i don't know how i guess it'd be interesting to see how you would you know put that in i guess it would be a different property or it would be a different it seems like it could be a quality of the units of measure but maybe that's for your specific instance and there's more general need to to, to not have it coupled to the unit like that hmm. so maybe this is one of those you know we could be having a, a look together um, when when like when you when you on the, on the DTL side um, you start start doing your design in more detail maybe we should have a touch base together and, and see kind of what what makes sense would that be a good idea 
Right, because it's likely zero K would be a default minimum for any real device. So you couldn't really use it as a scale setting in your application. But uh, there may be some other needs and maybe we want to think about that adding it to SDF if it's something that we could find useful. Yeah, and from the DTGL side, it'd be great to work together on this. This is not something that that we're immediately working on right now. Um, we, you know, we definitely have heard this feedback and had some discussions, but, um, but yeah, happy to happy to coordinate and discuss this more. Excellent. I I also noticed you had a bullet there about default constant values. Um, I could talk a little bit about that from the DTDL side as well. Um, please, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, we've we've definitely also heard this feedback, and we've this is something that we have been looking at um, more recently, at this idea of for a given. Uh, we've, I guess we've been looking at it for properties mostly, um, not for things like telemetry, but for properties for for the state information um, being able to provide. A default value we've we've been looking at we've actually sort of landed on calling it an initial value um with to try to convey that it's a value that's set initially when an instance of the um, entity is created uh but it's then not used anymore as is how we've been thinking about that from our side I guess that's semantically similar to what we call in default value, mm -hmm. uh, this in initial value. And then a constant would be that you actually you cannot change it. It will all, always be the same. Um, yeah. Yeah, we linked on an RDF literal, or, or do you have some other construct for that? Sorry, on the DTDL side or, or on S? Yeah, on DTDL. So we haven't, so constant, we actually haven't looked at constant yet. Um, I was just talking about the, the idea of default um, and we landed with initial because we wanted to convey the meaning that if, if you had an entity and it got an initial value, but then you, ch you, you then removed the value, it wouldn't go back to the default value. It would go back to having no value. And so we have, we, we, we actually have that semantic of it. So really a one time value that's applied. Which may be different than default, right? You can imagine if if you had a had a default value, you actually change the value to a real value, and then you remove that value. The question is, does it go back to default, or does it or does it stay at no value? Yeah, that's a good point. Mm, that, <clears throat> I, I, that's a very good really, point. <laughs> <laughs> that's something that would be a program bug, and and unless you uh, really work at at, at making it uh, impl explicit. So can we do a quick time check? Uh, we have almost used up this slot. Um, so how many more slides do you have, Ari? Last slide coming. Th th thanks, Carter. Great. Very, very good point. I mean, very, very, very good discussions. But but yeah, it's true. We should maybe should wrap up this segment soon so that we have time for the remaining ones. So yeah, I mean, we already had a good points on the on the way way forward. Um, Carson and I were, were drafting a, a few more things here that we also some of them discussed already. But if you go quickly through them, I mean, first of all, the question would be like, who, who is doing these DTBL models? And could we have something like a call for action to contribute those models? Because as we discussed earlier, it would be great to have more DTBL models to work on this conversion, see how we can how we can convert things. But then also um, in, in the one, one DM activity, we are collecting models from, from different ecosystems. And it would be awesome to have, of course, also DDDL models part of that that collection uh, effort that we can get longer term more alignment and more interoperability uh, across these different IoT data ecosystems. So, uh, any, any any thoughts from your the, the DDDL folks? Like, could we get the, more of these models somehow to our disposal? Yeah, I actually, I'm also going to put in the chat here, I saw just from a senior note here, a link to, we have for devices, um, we, we have this, um, we call our device side plug and play um, for devices. 
Oh, is that the uh, old IoT plug and play from from a few years ago? It's just that's that's still around. Okay, cool. I, I saw that and wondered about. Yeah, that. It's, it's yeah, it's IoT plug and play. And so what we have for that is we have a model repository where uh, device manufacturers can drop their models in. It is a public GitHub repo, basically. Um, and and so I'll drop a link in to the chat. Well, um, it's a great place to go see you know example models that actually you know third parties have done and are have published about their devices. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, do, do you happen to know what, what is the license of, of those? Is something um, a permissive license that you know we can just take those models and translate to STF and and use those publicly, or is there some special license that would need to be taken into account? That's a good question on the individual models. Um, I'll have to check on what we do about that on those. Um, yeah, because I'm not seeing for any given individual one that we've got a license file there. Um, there's a license for the whole GitHub repository, but I suspect that might be there might be a different licensing here. So let me check on that and follow up on that. Okay, great. I mean, we do have on as mentioned on one DM. Um, we have a repository where we have, we have been collecting models translated from different ecosystems to STF. So it would be great to have a corpus of BDDL models also. Editorial comment that when we had our semantic workshop in 2015, was it that the Microsoft folks there proposed uh, an approach where they had people contribute their own models and didn't try to align on a common. Uh, meta model, and I think this is uh, this is we can see how that worked out versus what we're doing, and we can maybe work out a single way of sharing these two. Sounds good. Okay, Ex excellent. Um, then we already did discuss this uh, evolving STF to improve um, support for DDL models. So at least this uh, relations is something that we are already um, already ad adding to um, STF. But then I'll, I'll, let's see also if there are other things that we should add there. Oh, no, it's also taking into account the evolution uh, of, of, of DDL. Um, we already briefly talked about the ITF hackathon activity. So. Um, of course, it would, would be great I mean, if some of you are in, in the team are able to join that and, and maybe think about how we can improve the conversion capabilities between STF and IETF. And um, Karsten will be sending more information about that hackathon activity on the, on the RG list. And then you can see if that perhaps fits your schedules and you have possibilities to contribute there. And also one a simple thing what we discussed we could do here, since we do have a, a piece of code can convert, especially STF models to DDDL, um, simple thing we could do is that, um, you know, convert all of our STF models into, into DDDL and, and, and publish that. Um, so we would have a quite large set of then DDDL models um, available. So wondering, is that something you would find interesting uh, from the DDDL team point of view? Definitely. I mean, you know, sort of selfishly from our side, yeah, we're, you know, we're looking to, uh, you know, have as many things in DTDL as possible because, you know, selfishly from our side, that that just makes our ecosystem um, more usable. Okay. Then, then definitely, let, let, let's do that. And also, I mean, like, like for example, one of, one of my colleagues was looking at, okay, how can I, how can they, um, visualize STF models and hey, we could actually use some of the Azure DTDL tools to visualize these models if you just convert them to DTDL. So they are mm -hmm. that kind of interesting potential uh, on also you know sharing tools across ecosystems. Um, so let's let, 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 let's let's do that. Um, okay, any any other thoughts on 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 the way forward? Um, in addition to what we have talked today. So, sorry I'm late. This is Michael McCool. Um, Sebastian Cabot should be joining us soon. So, in addition to interconversion with SDF, uh, we also would like to look at interconversion between what, uh, what are things, uh, thing models, um, and thing descriptions. Um, that might be via SDF. 
And so it may be that what we want to do here is converge on a common set of features. Uh, and maybe we can't, and, and semantics, maybe we can't exactly define the same exact format for encoding things. But if we have a, a consistent set of features that allows some level of interconversion, that would be uh, a intermediate goal that might be worth aiming for. So I think we're working pretty hard on aligning Watt with SDF. So if DTL also aligns with SDF, that might be one way to do those conversions. So I'll also oh, plus very one if, if SDF and DTL uh, interconversion can be uh, made as a, as a complete as possible. Mm -hmm. No, that's that that sounds very good. I guess like the, the more ecosystems we have um, working on these ecosystems ecosystems, I mean, more powerful it, it is for all of us. So absolutely. Yeah, at the end of the day, this all gets dumped into an RDF database, and then you then derive new information from it. So if if we all agree that to use a RDF and and JSON LD and this sort of thing, it makes life a lot easier to uh, put the information all in the same place. And if the information all is slightly different. Um, at least if we can agree on some foundational technologies, that would be helpful. Now, I think SDF is not quite there for the RDF, but I, I guess there, uh, it's possible to convert it to a, an RDF information model and, and put it into the RDF database. Not that RDF is perfect or the optimal solution for everything, it's just a point of convergence. Indeed, uh, I know I, Michael Koster has been looking at on, on some of that that already. So that's definitely, I mean, a, a valid direction to ha have a look at. Good. Okay, but I think I mean, overall, we have a set of set of things we could be looking together. I mean, now, um, now summer vacations are are starting in Europe pretty soon, and people will be gone until until August, except for the IETF uh, in in between. So, but maybe we could think about something. Um, maybe September timeframe, a, a, a follow up on on this um, EVDL discussion. Would would, would that be a, a good idea? That'd be great from from my side for DTL. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. So then, then yeah, let's then let's touch base. You know, when we are. I mean, at, at the hackathon, at the latest, when we are all, all back from vacations and, and plan for that. And of course, there's also potential for those who don't take that long vacation to progress some of these, these work items. Um, very good. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I know we're a bit, bit over time already, but um, Milan, um, how, do, how do you think? And can we, well, well, first of all, I mean, we do have our, our, our third uh, agenda item, and we were discussing that, okay, we'll use how much, how much time we have left for that. And now it seems we went, unfortunately, over time with the digital discussion. So what I would suggest, um, those of me, of course, who have to leave half past, um, we're very welcome to do so. But if some of our others have time to go, let's say, 10 minutes over time, we could then have a, still a proper discussion on, on the thing model. Um, what are, would, would that be okay? Or that someone violently uh, disagree. I guess maybe it's mainly for you, Sebastian. Would you be able to go like ten minutes over time the original agenda time? Yeah, um, I mean it would be actually as I mentioned in the email too cool uh, to have uh, would be cool to have more time because there are some yeah. great news in the thing model um, which you can do. Uh, modeling and and to create thing description out of that um and we have also some uh experience with sdf definition and to have this in as a thing model representation i think um, to be realistic it it would be pity to have too less time on that and uh, i think it's a very in interesting uh, topic for you and i'm just Thinking it makes more sense to to have it, yeah, after the summer break then. Yeah. Okay, I mean, hey, we, 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 sorry, go ahead. 
I was also going to say we have our face to face, our what face to face in the next two weeks. We have an open day on the 28th. And the other thing we could do is maybe uh, we're going to be going through the thing model anyways during that. So what I'd like to suggest is people who are interested can join that appropriate that session, and you can email me or Sebastian to find out when that is, and we can also point you at the wiki. But we also probably want to schedule, uh, like I, I suggest and suggest after the summer, a longer session, probably at least half an hour to present the thing model and to walk through it and discuss the relationship to SDF. So why don't we do that? Well, we can also invite people to the face-to-face -face if they want to have something more, more immediate. Uh, sounds like a very, very, very good idea. Um, so yeah, at least send, send that info, info to me. I mean, we'll be, I would love to join if, if it at all fits my schedule. Okay, I'll I'll uh, follow up with you with an email, and you can share it with the group uh, as appropriate. Yep. And then Sebastian, Very good. how do you want to organize the logistics for? Do you just want to do the next wishy call? Just put it down as a as an agenda item for the next wishy call, whenever that is. That would my proposal, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let, let, let's do that. So that would be roughly September, uh, maybe maybe late August, early September, that time frame. Um, very good. Okay. And, and okay. since since we are we have all here and around, maybe uh, just uh, off topic here, but uh, we have this open day, and and maybe it would be also cool to have from your side the latest from SDF. And and Brian, you're also here. Maybe it would be kind of cool to have also the latest from uh, the uh, Lita DL language. Um, maybe you have also time to give us a presentation on that. And um, and um, Michael Michael McCool, when 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 is planned the open day? So maybe we can already share the date here. Uh, it's the twenty eighth, and I believe it's uh, eight a.m. Eastern to uh, to noon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I will dig up the uh, the link and share it on I guess the notes. I'll do that right now. Okay, good. Well, thank, let, 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 let's do that. Thank, thank you, Sebastian and, and Michael. And um, let's now then take Milan. Go go ahead. Um, you have the remaining nineteen minutes. <laughs> yeah. I'll, um, wrap it up. Um, so this is, uh, by my count, the third update on the topic, and this time there are some there's some tangible progress to report. So just as a quick reminder. Uh, this is basically uh, the TRG paper that describes key features of IoT data standards that we've been talking about for a while. Uh, data standards referring to information models, not all of them. Uh, they describe them in a consistent manner. The idea was to, to make it for the better landscape understanding and comparisons and, and possible selections by those who want to use them. And, and the idea was to provide a high level sort of description of purpose, scope, and approach of, of the relevant standards, but do it in a common format so that it's easier to understand them uh, following the common structure and, and, and at least highlighting some of the topics that we agree on should be covered. And this is, I put my initials here in parentheses. One of my goals is, and, and I don't know if there is a group agreement we haven't discussed it as a consensus, is that such a document should be usable by researchers and IoT practitioners, of course, for selection and use of things, but not just uh, standards definition organization wants and insiders. In other words, not just the fine points of comparison of standards, but rather helping somebody who is outside to understand the lay of the land and, and where various things fit and how they may fit you know, their the objectives. And again, we said not to do the details of the inner workings and, and essentially rehash the specs and, and not really judge or evaluate them in any way, just basically state their choices and, and, and objectives explicitly. So in terms of status update, I have written in mid-April the first draft of the thing, and uh, I'll describe briefly what's in it. And uh, 
at this point, it's, uh, it's written in the internet RFC draft, draft format, one of my favorite publishing uh, models. And, and it is essentially a description of a description, basically what should be the standard description and outlining essentially what and why. So currently, the content of the document is, is basically uh, these major bullets are the sections. So there is the introduction and problem statement, you know, what is information modeling? Why do you need semantic interoperability in IoT? That is machine to machine communication that has to be machine interpretable meaning of data and, and goes into some detail what the meaning of data in this context mean. Basically, that the machines have the code that they can uh, recognize a particular type and object and, and know how to process it, assuming that, that they are so accurate. Uh, and then the next chapter does, uh, the next section, a brief overview of IoT information models, mostly object-oriented, what's the structure, object types, properties, attributes, interactions, and links, and IoT frameworks basically, the, is that a question? No. And IoT frameworks that they provide in addition to information models, typically some definition of the runtime environment. Um, it could be serialization protocol, binding, security management, or some combination of those. But the main point there is in order to comply and use the framework, uh, one has to implement the entire framework and be compatible with it in addition to the information model itself. So that's basically introductory and, and sort of orientational discussion up to this point. And then there is an outline of what should be in the common criteria, what should be covered and roughly in, in, in what way. And currently the sections of objectives and purpose basically state what's the objective of the thing and what is the purpose for devices to communicate in specific domain, for machines to so let's say discover and, and, and uh, engage with each other previously seen or unseen in any case and or whether it's thing descriptions like web of, web of things, or meta models like SDF and kind of what are, how it is intended to be used. One thing that I haven't added and probably it could be just an elaboration in this section is to have what is the basic conceptual approach to the problem of that particular standard and what are sort of the key architectural and design principles, sort of the design foundation that is based on. Uh, then the next thing, which is important, I think, is the domain of usage. If there is a primary target, vertical or verticals, it would be nice to state that usually many of the standards that I've seen say, oh, they're applicable to all things IoT, but when you look into their object, models and definitions, they typically tend to be clustered in one or two uh, target domains, at least initially. So it would be nice to articulate that explicitly at some, within the description. The other, I think, important thing is the environmental assumptions. Basically, what is assumed to be in place for the specification to work? In other words, what does it provide and define, and what else it assumes or doesn't define but needs to be there in order to work so that because sometimes that's left open as an exercise to the reader. The next topic, is, uh, this is a very brief one, if, if interoperability assumptions, if there are some in, in, in a particular specification, if it interoperates with others or intends to, to indicate what and how. Uh, and, and sort of the next section is a little bit of a potpourri of, I don't know, Currently, the structure is would be nice to know. So these previous, I regard that are pretty much mandatory in a useful description of a standard. And in the nice to know categories would be additional descriptions that the adopters may be interested in or would like to know. For example, metadata handling. Uh, are the metadata defined within the specification? Usually there are, but some. And if you want additional metadata, is there a mechanism or a scheme or an expectation of how to incorporate them, maybe as an overlay like a haystack or something? Uh, in any case, some indication to that effect would be useful. Uh, I think it's also good to know how the new object types are created in a particular specification. Is it something um, like crowdsourcing that OCF does and a haystack? 
or do you have to wait for the high priest to define the object before you can use it? And, and can you bring forward a proposal that's basically that, that is sort of architecturally compliant with, with the principles and, and design practices? Uh, so, so Milan, more generally, yeah. there's the mechanism for how to get access to the data. So there's the yeah. metadata itself and how it's described, and there's the access mechanism. So one yeah. way might be, you know, a repository like a GitHub site. Another way you're looking at in Web of Things is having a directory service that is queryable, that might be yeah. like distributed. Yeah, yeah. But in general, yeah, you know, typically the specs currently in information model have fairly limited metadata. So if one wants to have more, you know, is it possible and how a directory would be certainly, you know, one way of doing that. Well, yeah, we can also have smart object approach where objects are self-describing. So my point is there's different ways to get access to the metadata, which affect the use cases and even the kind yeah. of metadata you can have. So. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah, I agree. I'm of the opinion self-describing is kind of can get tricky in the sense what you need to know what to ask and how to interpret it, right? And, and what you need to construct, which brings me to my next point in development consideration and assumptions uh basically there are some you know assumptions and considerations in terms of languages or environment but i think the important one which, which um, relates to what you just said michael is uh, i've noticed in many standards there's basically implied assumption often you know to be derived by osmosis in terms of what the node is supposed to be created to be able to do at the design time in other words what the code is written for right uh, for some basic properties of things versus runtime, what can yeah, it expect yeah. to discover and how to ex interpret those? Because when you're, you know, designing, yeah. writing the code for the node, you need to know those things, right? So right, right. I, I was going to say that we we actually in one of the things we have two things: we have thing model and we have thing description. Thing model yeah. is development time, basically, and thing description is meant for runtime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but uh, I agree, and Web of Things is one of the few who separates that nicely, and you know fairly clearly in the sense from the design point of view and something like that for the others, at least to, to indicate what's assumed, right? In the, the, right, right. And if there are tools and reference implementation, especially for frameworks that helps a lot because you know, to implement the framework, it's much easier if you have something to start with. And then the licensing terms are also good to know, you know, whether you have to be a member of the club or you have to pay the fee or you just take right. it and, and run it. Um, so these were basically the things sort of that I have, as I said, put in this document and and uh, we have it in, in, in on GitHub, but I think it's a closed repository. Karsten has access and the two Michaels, but uh, so the, the next steps are, you know, okay, so we need to elicit, or I would like to elicit uh, the work group feedback and contributions and, and, you know, revise the document accordingly. So we may make it uh, perhaps more visible. And, and there are at least two types of comments that, you know, all comments are welcome, but there is the light touch, which would be greatly appreciated and it doesn't take much time, is basically comments, sort of high level comments on the direction, yeah, we need this or we don't need this, and things to include or exclude, you know, have these things, you have to have this, and uh, some other things that may be less of less general interest. And, uh, you know, I have my opinion, but that's my opinion as well. So, you know, uh, it should be a group consensus and in order to be useful. <clears throat> and of course, contributions like, you know, if somebody wants to write a section and, and be added to the list of authors, that's great. And um, then the next thing is to produce the uh, our, our work group um, approved the document. Sorry, I'm having a problem. Just a second. Okay, we'll go to break. <clears throat> Basic, um, sorry, my voice. Here we go. Uh, to produce the approved document, I don't know that there is a process <clears throat> for approving. And then potential future expansion is to work with STOs and interested STO if, if they want to contribute to the description using this format or we'll work collaboratively in accomplishing that 
And, and I can see two coins of that, you know, it would be great. It makes the paper more useful if we do that. And the downside is it can extend its timeline. So I wouldn't make it mandatory for the first pass, but certainly allow for appendices and subsequent expansions. And then basically incorporate that feedback and, and revise criteria based on that experience. And then at some point possibly publish as the informational paper. So that's sure. what I have is the update. Thank you. So with respect to the process, uh, there indeed is a, a process um, that uh, usually goes through a number of stages. So we, we will have enough stages uh, that we can collect uh, comments from, from various people. And of course, the first stage is getting an internet draft uh, out there and the, the getting uh, comments on that and so on. And then at some point, we are going to make a research group adoption call, which asks the research group whether uh, the research group believes this is useful work and wants to commit uh, time on, on contributing. And then it is uh, a research group document, and then probably it will go through a mo few more revisions. And again, we, we have, uh, we're going to ask people to contribute. And then at some point we do a research group last call, and uh, then we go through various further review and quality control st st uh, steps, and it's finally published as an RFC. But the, the point about an RFC is that it, it may be called request for comments, but this is really the, the point where we actually uh, no longer are actively looking for comments. Well, we, we, we are always actively looking for comments, but uh, we, we publish things as RFC where we think it's it's already stable enough that people will be able to live with it for a year uh, or two. Yeah. So it, it's really important to use the uh, two internet draft stages, the individual submission stage and, and the uh, research group document uh, stage uh, to get those, those uh, contributions, to get those uh, pieces of feedback. Yeah. Karsten, what's your suggestion? How much should we gestate this within the group, sort of as the, as the work in progress, before it makes sense to go to the internet draft? In other words, should we do that sooner or later? Um, I actually must admit I haven't seen a version of this document for two months now. Um, so um, I think we we uh, maybe should uh, look at this uh, uh, once more and then publish it as an internet draft because, I mean, the word publish really has very many me meanings in the IETF. Um, so this means it's out there. We can ask people to, to uh, comments, to make comments uh, and, and people see it. And uh, then after a few more uh, rounds, which can happen very quickly, uh, we can make a research group adoption call and ask whether this should become a research group document. Okay, well, that, that works. I was going to appeal to the two Michaels who I know have a lot of stuff and tables written in this space to at least send me the stuff, the raw stuff that they may have that, that is kind of relevant to this and then I can if necessary, I can even try to fit them, you know, in the context without them having to do. Yeah, well, I, I just updated my uh, repo um, to catch up with what the latest version is. And I think what I need to do is uh, post an issue to link to the stuff because some of it's kind of big. But uh, I'll see where I can stick it in the repo. Uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll have some maybe PowerPoint initially, but we'll I'll do that at least and then we'll go from there. Yeah. We'll do that right now, and then we'll have to catch up where I can convert them to text. Yeah, that works. Okay. Fine. Good. It seems we have uh, reached the end of our time. So, Sebastian probably was right that we uh, should postpone this. Uh, so I'm I'm really interested in in hearing the the uh, update. So I think we should advertise this this uh, open day so people in the uh, research group and people in Wishy uh, know about that. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, find a, a time in, in September, in early September, where we can reconvene because most of Europe is going into various forms of uh, shutdown right now. For once, not COVID shutdown, but vacation shutdown. But mm -hmm. uh, that means we won't get done a, a lot of things in the next two months. In, indeed. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I think it's a very good update, some very, very good discussions. I think we have a set of things uh, to look forward uh, in, in the coming wishy meetings. And then meanwhile, in the top of things meeting and the ITF meeting. Um, yeah, uh, um, um, Ari, is it cool when I can ping you and ask you about the open day, so maybe to get an update of the SDF? Um, the same is also true to Brian to get some update on the DDPL. Mm -hmm. That would be quite cool. And I, I did add a link to the notes um, for the wiki page for the face of face. Uh, and generally speaking, we have a two hour session actually uh, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern time. So I know it's awkward for Pacific time, but that's kind of a intermediate uh, time that works for everybody in Europe. Mm -hmm. I'll take a look at my calendar for that from the DTL side. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, likewise, um, yeah, Sebastian, please do ping me. Let, let's see, let, let's figure out some good way to yeah, uh, get get done. Let's do it offline then and then yep. verify the yep. dates yep. and times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very, very good. Any other final comments before we close for today? Well, uh, I would just like to point out we do have the the hackathon in in uh, the week before ITF one eleven. So, um, if you have uh, the ability to to join there, uh, please uh, tell me and uh, please think about what what kind of uh, converters and and other processors uh, you want to bring to the. Uh, hackathon and uh, maybe also play with uh, the SDF Yang converter that uh, became accessible today. So uh, if you have an SDF model that you wanted to see how it would look like in Yang, please try that and please try the inverse as well. If you have a device that is described by a Yang model, uh, look at the, the SDF model and maybe tell us how, how well uh, that worked. So with that, um, I think on the 19th, we will be we will be having the introductory meeting to the hackathon. And I think that should be a wishy meeting focusing on, on the uh, conversion um, issues. And uh, then in September, we will have the next full uh, wishy meeting. Okay, well, with that, thanks a lot for everyone joining. A special thanks to the DTDL team. Uh, I think it was very good progress that we made here. And um, yeah, looking forward to continue from here very soon again. Thank you. And Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Everyone.